So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Rescue me from danger as we again continue on in our sermon series of Matthew. We're going to look uh, on Peter. We're going to look at the different stories of Peter. And today we're in a story that we find in the three, uh, three of the Gospels, not only Matthew, but in Mark, also in John. And what we find is that when Jesus is there, the weary find rest and the hungry souls are fed. When Jesus is there, the weary souls find rest and the hungry soul is fed. So what does this mean? Well, in this uh, section of scripture that we're reading, a fancy word for that is pericope, but the uh, section of scripture that we're reading is in Matthew 14, we begin with chapter 22, and it says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat. Well, what happened before then? Well, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. There had been the teaching of the multitude and the breaking of the loaves and the fish and in the feeding. And when that was done, he wanted to go and pray. So in verse 22, immediately made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So Jesus not only feeds and teaches and preaches, he's also crowd control. You go there, tells them that it's all done, nothing more to see here. So after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And while evening came, he was there alone. So what did Jesus do? He went to pray. He went to pray by himself. He took time after a very busy, busy day, a physically exhausting day, an emotionally exhausting day, a spiritually taxing day, what did Jesus go do? He went and prayed. How many of us do that? There's a little lesson right there in which we could stop. Many of us, when we want to debrief, we turn to other things. We scroll, we look at social media, we watch TV, we do things, right? I do that too. Jesus went and prayed. He knew the source of his strength and his foundation, which was to go by himself and be alone with God in prayer. When evening came, he was there praying by himself. But by this time, the boat, which was battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. So it was many stadia, about an eighth of a mile away. Each stadia is about an eighth of a mile in distance away. So they were quite a ways away from the shore. And he went to them early in the morning, we figure roughly around 3 a.m., somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he walks to them, and in verse 25, early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But understand, there was a storm going on, right? The wind was blowing, the waves were battering against the boat. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. I am. I am Jesus who shows who the God of Israel is. The people meet the God of Israel through the actions of Jesus. Just as God came to Moses in the burning bush and said, I am, Jesus here says, I am, do not be afraid. Verse 28, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I don't know about you, but that's not quite what I would do if I thought it was a ghost, right? What does that really prove, right? If somebody's out for, against me, they, oh yeah, come here, buddy, step out in, the, out in the storm in the water, see what happens to you. But nonetheless, that's how the story goes. And so Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. Now, this is similar to what uh, the Satan or the devil did in tempting Jesus Christ out in the wilderness. If you truly are the son of God, just turn these stones into bread. Cast yourselves down from the high place. The angels will not let you, your foot dash against the stone. But Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, and he started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. 
saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. This is Peter, the preeminent disciple on whom the church is going to be built. But he sinks due to what? A lack of faith. There's a loss of focus in his vision, in his direction, in his attention. The good news is, if this can happen to Peter, it can happen to any of us. Maybe that's bad news, I don't know. But if it happened to him, and when it happens to us, we shouldn't feel so bad. But we can be safe in the knowledge that Jesus Christ will reach out to us to save us when we call. I'll come back to that in a moment. The miracle stories that we see in the Bible, the miracle one where Jesus had fed the 5,000 with just a few fish and loaves, here where Jesus is walking on the waters, these miracle stories we should see not as something of which happened, but what is happening. If we say Jesus Christ is the Lord, that miracles are happening, then we have to believe that the power of God through Jesus Christ is working in your life, bringing about good. That what you're focusing on and praying on, that that can truly happen. The timing of when that happens, though, is where we get all sort of up in the face of God, don't we? Because we really want it to happen according to our timetable so we don't have to make tough choices so that we might not to have to, you know, set aside and determine what is the most important thing in our life. We want God to act right here and now so it's really easy in where we spend our time and where we spend our money and how we can create our calendar. But Jesus shows up. The storm had been raging. The storm had been going all night. They were tired physically. They were tired mentally. They were worried about capsizing. Now, these, some of these were tried and true fishermen. It's probably not their first storm, but there was, it was moving against them. But when Jesus is there, the weary find rest and the hungry soul is fed. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus is in a storm, right? In, in Matthew 8, they are out there, and um, also in the Gospel of Luke, they're, they're in the storm, and what's Jesus doing in the boat? He's taking a nap, right? I love naps. usually try to get one in on a Sunday afternoon. If I can, I had a glorious one yesterday afternoon. Jesus is taking a nap, and there's a storm going on. They're like, hey, Jesus, we're about to sink. Do you not care? And he says the same thing, ye of little faith. And with one, hurt, one word, he stills the storm. Jesus had gone alone to pray. Jesus had gone and done those things which allowed him to be full of the Spirit, full of the power, full of knowing where to turn, that when the storm would come, he would know what to say and what to do. Why didn't Jesus just still the storm before he walked out to them on the boat, right? Maybe, I don't know, when you're Jesus, maybe the storm isn't that difficult, he just walks through the storm to where they are. Now, the boats in Jewish literature are used for, um, in the storms to depict those who are in persecution. The boat can also represent the mission of the church, the mission of the church, which is in persecution in a storm. But Jesus is there. The sea, the force of chaos is often represented there. But this chaos is held at bay by the powerful acts of God through Jesus. Jesus, like God, was there at the beginning over the primordial waters. We read about that in Genesis. Water is a symbol of chaos, of death, of life, of new life. God has given Jesus authority over all things. Everything in the cosmos here on earth over us. But Jesus went to them. Now we know that Jesus can do this, that, that we meet God through who Jesus is. 
the one in and through and by means God is made known. God is, by, is made known through what Jesus does, through what Jesus says, through the actions of Jesus. We are invited into relationship with God. It was in Job 9 where God and Job, who are going back and forth about everything that's happening against them, where God questions him. And it says that God stretched out the heavens and trampled on the waves of the sea, only the divine can walk upon the water. But Jesus says to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I am the great I am. And so there becomes of the story an identity, a, an epiphany, an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Now, that may not be a big deal to you. You know who Jesus is, right? But God, Matthew's writing this gospel to help people understand who Jesus Christ is and why he's come to this earth and what he is about and what he is doing. Now, this is important to understand because we would think after over 2,000 years, we would know who Jesus Christ is, but we don't, right? Because we see about it on, on the internet and friends who, who don't believe in a God, who don't believe in Jesus Christ, who don't believe in any of this. They are, they're so much smarter and they understand it. If they can't feel it, see it, know it, then it can't be real. I can't see gravity. I don't know much about gra gravity, but I've certainly been hurt by gravity. We have a responsibility of seeing here within the story that Jesus Christ is the one who reveals this God of love to us in the world. We're called in this generation to proclaim goodness in the world against all things in the world that are going wrong, that are evil, that are working against us, where people are just being crappy towards each other. We are called to step out of the boat and see in the midst of the storm that if our eyes are on Jesus Christ, we can be brought into a new way that we do not have to sink down into the mire and into the culture and the way of being that so many other people are in this world. Jesus, save me. If we would only cry out, if we would only trust, if we would only do that. You see, in this epiphany, there's a, there's a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. In John chapter 8, as Jesus says to them, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was I am and the word was with God in the very beginning I am I can remember when I was younger and I, I was at a went to a Christian school and we read from the King James version of the Bible which if you've ever read that you know is, your, is a first second third fourth fifth grader that was a lot of thouest didst thouest stuff language it was tough and, and God says I am I'm like I am what does that mean I am. Well, how else do you describe God but I am? Everything that we need and more. Here's something interesting. What we say about Jesus, because there's this identity here. They say it was the rescue to the very end and the storm is calmed and everything seems fine. They're like, truly you are the son of God. Truly you are the Messiah. Truly you are different than we are. You are whom God has sent. It's the same thing that later on in Matthew 27, where the centurion and those who are witnessing Jesus Christ, that's the season of Lent that we're in, when Jesus Christ is on the cross and is crucified and dies, and they say, truly you are the Son of God. But do we recognize, are we willing to proclaim here and now who Jesus Christ is in our life? Because what we say about Jesus says something about us. What we say about Jesus says something about you. If we say, Jesus, you are my master, you are my teacher, then that means we are his disciples. If we say, Jesus, you are my Lord, then that means that we are his servants. Now, Jesus Christ came to serve. We see that in the foot washing. But if we say, Jesus, you are my Savior, do we act like that in our lives? Are we, in the moment of trouble, willing to cry out to Jesus, save me? If we are disciples of Jesus, are we willing to go by ourselves and pray to follow the model that Jesus says? If we say, Jesus, you are my master, 
another word for teacher. Are we the disciples, and are we willing to learn? Are you willing to change the way in which you live your life? Are you willing to read your Bible? Are you willing to say, you know what? The way I have thought about that is wrong. The way I've been living here in this situation is wrong. Am I willing to do one thing different in my life? Because as I look at what is happening now, the storm seems to be getting worse and worse, and these waves seem to be getting stronger and stronger against me. But oh no, don't mess with my sin, Lord Jesus. I want you to save me by making the storm silent so I can continue on doing what I do. If we say Jesus Christ is our master, our teacher, are we willing to let our life be changed and moved so that we reflect the glory of God in what we do? Now the storm was happening. And what did Jesus do? Do you sit there from far off and say, well, you got yourself into it? No, he walks out to the boat. Jesus, when seeing the disciples in distress, meets them where they are. Jesus, when he sees you in distress, meets you where you are. No matter how pitiful you think your life may be, no how well it may be going, or you've got everything so right because you've made everything happen in your life instead of relying on the power of God that moves things in your life. But you say, now in the storm, I need help. Jesus is there. But what we don't know is how long the storm went on. You see, that's where one of the challenges of churches, we preach this miracle story in 20 minutes. I've got barely enough time to keep your attention to really get into this. But there's a storm. Oh, Jesus saves us. Great. And then when that storm hits your life or when your young ones or people in middle school and high school get in the storm and the crap's going against them, they lose faith in Jesus because it's been two days of hardship. Sometimes two days turns into two months and into two years. I can understand that. We don't know how long the storm went on, but what we have to do is maturing disciples and Christians is realize that a storm will rage against us at times. And are we willing and disciplined enough to continue to cry out? Now, Jesus comes to the boat. What does Peter do? They were afraid at first, weren't they? You see, their vision in the middle of the storm wasn't all that good. Our job here today is to help your vision get better, to help you see Jesus coming. They were afraid. They cry out, it's a ghost. All they could see was the storm and what they thought was happening. But Jesus was bringing about something different in their life. If we focus on Jesus Now, Peter does this initially, hey, Jesus, if that's you, call me to come out. And he does, and he walks towards them. And what's interesting is he gets within, what, arm's reach of Jesus before he sinks. He's walking on the water. He's walking on the waves. Something is happening. But notice when he left the boat, 11 remained in it. I don't know what that means, but sometimes it means that you have to be the one willing to step out in faith when others stay within the security of the boat. You have to one to be willing to say, maybe this is a step I take while my family sits back and watches. Maybe this is the step I take while all my friends sit back and ridicule me. Maybe this is the step you take out of the boat, which says, this is the way I go. Even when everything else says, that's a big storm and it's really deep at the bottom. But Jesus is calling me. But even when Jesus is calling, we find it, we fall into the situation that even in post resurrection Easter time, where we lose faith, where we doubt, where we, where we get misguided, where we take our eyes off and we, we focus on all the negativity and bad things in life. And when you focus on that, you will find it. Watch all the negative and depressing headlines and news on TV, and your life will start spiraling downward. You will think the world is, why continue on? What you look for in life, you will find it. If you look for Jesus Christ, your weary soul will receive rest. When you look for Jesus Christ, you will be fed with the bread 
of life. But Peter was there and he begins to sink, but for Jesus. Peter is there and he begins to sink down into the mire, but for Jesus. Peter is there and begins to go down to his death, but for Jesus. Peter is there and he's beginning to get lost and trying to think, what can I do to save myself? But for Jesus who reaches forth his hand. And in that moment, I think of the words of the apostle. I've got more to reach out for than to hold on to. I persevere on towards the prize, right? Peter reaches forth his hand to Jesus. And you know what? The storm continued. The storm continued, but he had the hand of Jesus. The help was there. It didn't matter if the storm was going on. Jesus was holding him, and they went to the boat. And once they were in the boat, the storm stopped. Where would your life be but for Jesus? Where would your life be but for Jesus? In the middle of all of this, are you willing to... Say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, help me. We could stay in the boat. You could do nothing. It's not how little we sin, it's how much we love. Are you willing to go out into the stormy waters and the sea knowing that Jesus is there? That you may fail? I was listening to a podcast by Greg Rochelle, and he was talking about how he plans to fail. That kind of really hit home with me because a lot of mentality is, well, you can't have any fallback plan. Otherwise, you know, that's what you'll do. You'll give up easily. But what he talks about is that learning to fail is realizing that we will make a mistake and that we rely on this grace of Jesus Christ in our life. And in that mistake, we learn something and we get back up. And we keep going. Motivation, inspiration will fade. You might be motivated, inspired today, but at some point you just might be physically too tired, emotionally too tired. But that's when the other people in the boat, that's when the other people in this church pray for you. They pray for you. We pray for each other. We pray for this world. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our ministries. That somebody will be inspired and emboldened to step out even when they don't know the answers. Even when it seems so obvious. And they start down a path and then they begin to sink. In Psalm 69, the psalmist writes this, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched, my eyes fail, while I wait for God. The storm rages on. In your life... Those moments when you begin to sink, there's going to be a lot of people around you that are going to say, well, that's what you get. That's your own fault. That's the consequences of what happened. But for Jesus, who had a different plan for your life. You see, the Bible should never be used to reinforce the way things are, only to support the reign of God. The Bible should never be used to support the way things are. People want to say, well, you aren't good enough. You don't have enough faith. That's why you're sinking. That's why bad things are happening to you. But for Jesus, who says, no, the reign of God is about forgiveness and grace. Let me reach out my hand. Here it is. You've called. I'm right here. Will you grasp it? The outstretched hand of Jesus Christ is right here. Amen.